2022 had a new Crazy Frog song and a big pop hit interpolating Eiffel 65. If that's not a sign of how good this year was, I don't know what is! <laughs> Wow! Wow, wow, wow! What a year it's been, huh? 2022 has given us an absolute cavalcade of music, running the entire spectrum of genre and star power. The only artists who did not release new music in 2022 were all of the artists who released new music in 2021. And even then, some of them double-dipped. Volume isn't the only thing worth applauding, because a lot of the music released was good. Whether you were catching an artist's long-awaited return, witnessing their big break, or making a note to tell people you were into them before they were cool, this year had it all. As with all of my lists, I ask that you not take these rankings super, super seriously. These are my 10 favorite albums of the year, but them being placed in a numerical hierarchy is just because lists are fun to make. This is supposed to be fun. And please feel free to leave your favorite albums in the comments below and check out the playlist in the description with all the songs that I play or mention. Drum roll, please. Number 10. I've been wondering for a while now when this artist would make it onto one of my top 10 lists because I I've liked albums that they've made in the past and I consider myself to be a fan of theirs. And I'm happy to say that this year they officially became part of the list, or in their case, part of the band. She was part of the Air Force, I was part of the band, I always used to If there's one thing that has defined the 1975, it's excess. Massive track lists, album openers narrated by Greta Thunberg, lyrical themes about society and how much we live in it, and also how much Maddie Healy wants to have sex. So color me surprised when their latest record, Being Funny in a Foreign Language, scaled back on the 1975-isms. You know. Relatively. Right off the bat, bam, we're doing LCD sound system. Also, for the first half second, Maddie sounds exactly like Bon Iver. The overall sonic vibe is more organic than past 1975 records, in part thanks to producer Jack Antonoff. Jack's hands on this had me a bit concerned at first, as I have yet to click with his more recent work. However, I soon realized that this 1975 album is actually disguising itself as a Bleachers album with Maddie on vocals. And that is very good. You can hear how this approach benefits the band in the sax solos on Happiness, the glistening keys on Oh Caroline, the finger-picked guitar on When We Are Together. Perhaps, in keeping with the production, the lyrics this time don't shoot for the moon, the stars, and the black holes. The scope doesn't extend to societal musings, but rather keeps it locked to love and personal connection. I've seen some people say that this is beneath the 1975, but I'd argue the opposite. It's nice to see the band demonstrate that they can write something that doesn't try to cure the ails of our world. Sometimes you just want sing fun songs about cute girls. <coughs> I'm in love with you is a straightforward bop about expressing love for someone. All I need to hear is a tender ballad about wanting someone to express their love for you. Looking for somebody to love is... Actually, that, that song is pretty dark. Okay, fine. You listen hard enough and the usual Maddie Healy bars will show themselves. You think wintering is about an exuberant return home for the holidays and then bam, they hit you with a 10-year-old boy who loves fat ass. Oh, and part of the band, Jesus. Almost every line on here sounds destined to be a Tumblr bio. But push past the vaccinate tote bag chic baristas and you'll enjoy the pulsing strings on the verse and the lovely outro. Maddie Healy, you and your boys did real good. Next time you're in Boston, you better give me a big ol' kiss. Number nine. It's time for our collective group affirmation. Please repeat the following sentence at your viewing device. I will listen to the new Always record. For those who are uninitiated, here's a rundown on power pop group Always with two Vs. Their debut album from 2014 was good. Their follow-up in 2017 was great, a slept-on album that should have sent them to indie rock's upper echelon. Now, if you did not hear this album, I don't entirely blame you. Anti-Socialites came out during a very busy summer 2017. Not only are Always returning in a year when many artists who last dropped in 2017 are returning, but most of those new records are also good. Without a doubt though, Always stepped up their already A-tier game with this new record, Blue Rev. Each song shimmers with tight snares, crunchy guitars, reverb dense vocal harmonies. You close your eyes and you envision driving along the ocean as the sun beats down. Just try not to romanticize your life to the sounds of the gorgeous build on the outro of Pressed, that stellar key change at the end of Belinda Says, the hazy enveloping keys of Tile by Tile, the kind of everything of After the Earthquake. 
for real, what a perfect track that is. Though I will say, uh, always, if, if you're watching, you, you didn't need to pander to me by naming a song after me. Like, I, I was already excited for the album, but this just makes me feel a bit awkward. That aside, what Always Have Made here is a no frills, no fat, no fail rock album. Go check it out, and Anti-Socialites too. You from five years ago will appreciate it. Number eight. This has been such a surprising list so far. 1975, Always, both artists who have never made it onto one of my lists before. This list is feeling so fresh and unique. Who's up next? Oh, it's Carly Rae Jepsen, wow! On her past two albums, Carly Rae Jepsen has shown herself to be a phenomenal writer of liminal romance. The early stages of getting to know and love someone, where hesitation and self-doubt fester, but fade to dust once you give your crush a big ol' kiss. The Loneliest Time, however, is a wee bit different. Many of its songs look at the time after the lavender haze, growing comfortable with someone, wanting to reunite and give love another shot, or reminiscing on past loves that burned bright but ended for a reason. It's a remarkable step forward lyrically, but not only that, the record also manages to change up Carly's usual pop sound. Not that that needed to happen. If she decided to release albums that were just run away with me ten times in a row for the rest of her life, I would gobble that up. But it's also cool that she's, you know, changing and you know, developing as an artist. There's Western Wind with its solar power-esque production courtesy of Rostam, or Beach House with its deadpan delivery on deadbeat dudes, or even the title track with its Rufus Wainwright feature and TikTok famous bridge. And of course, there's still plenty of expected potent pop bops like Bad Thing twice, sideways, so nice, and talking to your self. Plenty of other records captured my attention this year, but when it comes to The Loneliest Time, Carly herself said it best. I'm coming back for you, baby. I'm coming back for you. Number seven. 2022 was a weird year for the biggest stars. We got new records from a lot of heavy hitters, but in a monkey's paw way. Drake drops two albums, but one is house music, and one is a collab with 21 Savage, and this is the cover. Post Malone drops an album, but it's a melancholic turn with virtually no hits and a Fleet Foxes collab. Sometimes those big drastic turns didn't fully pay off. Other times, All the boys and girls, I got some true stories to tell. Though now that I say it, Kendrick Lamar's return this year also outmaneuvered our expectations. The first new music from him was The Heart Part 5, which absolutely floored me. I was so amped up to see him revisit the jazz of De Pimp a Butterfly. And then a few weeks later, we got Mr. Morale and The Big Steppers. And it was exactly like De Pimp a Butterfly, except it wasn't really. It was more like Damn or Good Kid Mad City, except it wasn't like those either. Mr. Morale has no interest in placating to anyone's idea of what a Kendrick Lamar album should be. He instead dedicates his first record in 1,855 days to diving into the deepest parts of his psyche. The gorgeous piano and haunting strings on United in Grief, the unnerving beat on Worldwide Steppers, the... Thanks for the dinner invite, guys. Of We Cry Together, the gut-wrenching story told on Mother I Sober, the part on Silent Hill where Kendrick goes, <laughs> that part isn't very emotional, it's just funny. And even when the album focuses more on sick bangers and jams, it does so with gusto, like on N95, Purple Hearts, Die Hard, and Savior. I could also try to talk about my mixed feelings towards Auntie Diaries or Kodak Black's inclusion, but let's be real, none of us are changing our minds about them at this point in the year. So instead of talking about that, check out this sick backflip. That was one sick flip. Kendrick uses both sides of this album to explore the messy process of bettering yourself amid a web of generational trauma. And even when I disagreed with the execution, I appreciated and enjoyed the results. Number six. La Rosalía. En Nueva York, visitando mis joyeros. Solo quiere que yo le doy mi dinero. Patinaki. Chicken macaroni. Rosalia has had one hell of a 2022. Critical praise has never been lacking in her career up to this point, but 2022 cemented her as a bold, fresh voice in pop music. Now, if you look at any other 2022 year-end list, you're gonna see her record Motomami on it somewhere. But I've also seen this 
strong pushback against it? Uh, the lyrics specifically. A good amount of people don't care for the lyrics on here. Now, on one hand, I can look past it more easily because the lyrics are not sung in English, and I'm just not going to be able to fully understand unless I've got a translation in front of me. For someone who better understands Spanish, then sure, it could be a bigger issue. You also got to remember that I am a child of late 2000s and early 2010s pop. I had that boom boom pow. I pretended that airplanes in the night sky were like shooting stars. When I drank, I did it right getting slizzard. I can forgive a lot of dumb lyrics if the music is up to snuff, and Motomami is very much up to snuff. There was no other record in 2022 that so eagerly delighted in messing with me. Opener Saoko is driven by this sick distorted bass line, then hey jazz piano breakdown, Bizcochito, Mary's production reminiscent of the late Sophie with a pseudo schoolyard chant, Diablo darts between 20 different auto-tuned vocals only to have James Blake crash in, James what are you doing here? Go back to crashing in on the forever story. And even when the record does slow down in focus, it reveals that Rosalia has a stellar voice and she's backed by engaging production, like on Candy, La Fama, and the haunting closer, Sakura. Oh wait, and how can I forget my love for Hen- Number five. So a few spots back, I said that a lot of our pop stars spent 2022 subverting expectations. But there was one artist who may have subverted them the most by delivering exactly what I expected. Take off the show. Have you heard of this underground singer named Beyonce? She was in this one girl group, she married Jay-Z. Pretty cool stuff, check her out. Beyonce is now in this place that so few pop stars occupy, where she shifts the culture anytime she is simply perceived. Her 2013 self-titled album came with a surprise drop and full music videos for each song. Her 2016 album, Lemonade, had the infidelity narrative and the full short film. These records didn't make waves, they made tsunamis in pop culture. Her latest album, Renaissance, had nothing, really. No larger narrative, no tabloid scandal, not even music videos aside from a few teasers and visualizers. The track America Has a Problem implies some political commentary, but the problem in question is just how much of a sleigh Beyonce is. Yeah, my marriage has a problem. Every night when I'm in bed, raccoons break in and nibble at my toes! It's also apparently the first in a trilogy? Though the second and third albums haven't been formally announced yet. It entered the world as just a new Beyonce album. Of course, that on its own has plenty of significance. Beyonce is probably our greatest living active pop star in the same way that Tom Cruise is our greatest living active movie star. You might have your opinions of him, but when you go see Top Gun Maverick, you are reminded that there are very few people operating at his level. Renaissance is the Top Gun Maverick of pop albums. Beyonce enlisted top players to craft an immaculate love letter to disco and dance. You can hear that level of care in tracks like Cozy, lead single Break My Soul, Pure Honey, and the sheer this of Virgo's groove. Eight minutes of phenomenal funk. Not to mention the flow, the flow of this thing. Album pacing is such a difficult thing to nail and Renaissance managed to keep my attention consistently. Special shout out to the run from Cuff It to Energy to Break My Soul, plus the last five tracks. Renaissance is potent, it's sexy, it's a blockbuster that shows what pop music can be at its highest level. Double Snare is a really weird card and a little confusing at that. Number four, I've reached that age where friends and acquaintances are either settling down or getting real freaky. Crazy Frog's been doing really well, tending to his own sanity, but you remember Zerottle from the Blue Daba Dee Daba Die music video? This is him now. Listen to this sound to destroy God. <laughs> My point is, it's truly wonderful to see good friends growing and doing well. But you know what I love seeing even more? When they do well and make great records from it. Pop Trio Muna's last album, Saves the World, was one that I didn't catch until a few months after its release, but I was over the Muna for it. Some of the most emotive pop tracks about self-doubt, insecurity, and learning to love yourself holistically. And it makes sense that after that document of healing, their follow-up would be a bit of a reintroduction. If Saves the World chronicle the period of personal growth, Muna is all about the subsequent celebration. It's when you say to yourself, I went to therapy, I bought a year subscription to Headspace, I read some bell hooks, and now I'm going out on the town like the hot bitch I am. Silk Chiffon captures the adrenaline rush of connecting with someone for the first time. It has a Phoebe Bridgers feature, and it goes very well with Nickelback's photograph. <laughs> 
I wasn't joking. What I want recounts a hot night out where your only mission is to get... You know. It's in the title. Solid takes pride in a stable relationship. Even when a track is self-reflective, it still retains a strong sense of self. Anything But Me reaffirms compassion for a past partner while still keeping healthy distance. Runner's High uses the titular metaphor to explain the lack of reaction to a breakup. Kind of Girl takes stock in personal growth and recognizing that loving yourself is a journey and not a destination. And of course, each track comes complete with quality hooks and great production inspired by 80s and 90s synth pop. Muna by Muna is tremendous. Tremendous. Get on the Moonamobile now before they open for Taylor Swift next year and become huge megastars. Number three. Wow, those worm's eyes have got to be melted. I wonder if they can see their future. In a place where we could hardly survive and barely could thrive, my only focus staying alive like zombies revived. My first taste of curry was his 2018 record, Taboo, then his tape with Kenny Beats in 2020. Each time I enjoyed Denzel's presence as a lyricist and performer, but to say Melt My Eyes, See Your Future exists on that same plane as those two albums would be a massive undersell. Denzel's latest is able to balance so many different ideas and threads into something that feels universal yet wholly specific. Not to mention, this record has some of the best hip-hop production of this year, held together by an aesthetic that draws in influence from sci-fi and anime. Melt Session 1 is an introspective stunner, complete with some drop-dead gorgeous keys from Robert Glasper. The keys on Angels are also gorgeous, dancing just out of reach in the background as Denzel waxes on about external validation. The back-to-back -back trio of Walkin, Worst Comes to Worst, and John Wayne just casually drop three of the best hip-hop chorus hooks of the year. X-Wing boasts quality trap production under thoughts on materialism and wealth. Ain't No Way is a hype as hell posse cut. Zatoichi is out here with those sick breakbeat drums on the chorus that just make me want to... <laughs> Trouble's got T-Pain swooping in for this buttery smooth hook. It's a lovingly crafted album that shines whether it's the studio recordings or the live renditions, which reminds me, a few months after the bass album released, Denzel dropped a deluxe version with live recordings of many tracks. And I might as well put that bonus collection as number 3.5 on this list because they're tremendous. Even with Melted Eyes, the future I see for Denzel is very bright indeed. Then you can just simply dial in. Number two, <laughs> Ethel Kane. Who is Ethel Kane? Ethel Kane was at the bottom of her career. She was fat, broke, and nasty. She was performing like rent was due. You're goddamn right she was! Preacher's Daughter is the debut album by Floridian singer-songwriter Ethel Kane. It's a concept record, a cautionary tale as a now-deceased girl looks back on her life and how she ended up deceased. Themes include religion, generational cycles, and a descent into literal H.E. double gun. Though all that darker stuff doesn't fully show itself with the album's first proper song, American Teenager. If Taylor Swift ever releases her own song about a religious crisis of faith, it would probably sound something like this. It also goes very well with Don't don't stop believing. Again, I was not joking. What Ethel really nails on this album is space. Sometimes these songs evoke large expanses of land, as if you're looking out onto a sea of Midwestern farms. Thoroughfare builds across its first six minutes, then winds down with distant guitars and Ethel vamping. Sunbleached Flies kicks the door down with choir vocals and a sax solo while featuring the wrecking ball that is this line. God loves you, but not enough to save you. Other times, the heavy reverb creates paranoia as each sound combines to overwhelm your senses, and the lyrics take a much darker turn, focusing on abuse and violence in all of its forms. Ptolemaea depicts Ethel in one of the circles of hell, complete with the most horrifying scream heard in music this year. Rangers, um, you know that new Timothy Chalamet movie from this year, Bones and All? Yeah, it's, it's like that. It's an absolutely inspired tale that Ethel tells on Preacher's Daughter. It's not easy to stomach at every point, but if you give it your time and attention, you will be treated to one of the most rewarding listening experiences of 2022. Before we get to number one, I want to rattle off a bunch of honorable mentions. I'm not limiting myself to 10 this year because there's a whole lot of records that I want to at least give some kind of shout out to. Let's go. The Weeknd had that great pop album with that song that should have been a way bigger hit, the one that went, I don't want a sack of rice. 
guys. Barty Strange continued to be indie rock's number one rising star. For real, this man is gonna be a household name in a few years, Ben on it. The Beths delivered yet another excellent collection of rock bops. Gang of Youths made this towering, sprawling document on faith, trauma, and family. Brett from Flight of the Concords and the Muppets movies made a great classic singer-songwriter album. Jid outdid these hip-hop kids with the Forever Story. SZA's new album would probably be higher if I had more time to digest it, and that's also true for Little Sim's new record. Big Thief gave us a brilliant double record sprawl of indie folk. If I don't mention Ants from up there, I will get death threats. Phoenix were out here dropping synth pop bangers as if it was still 2009. Pusha T made a new Pusha T album, so that's all you need to know there. Black Midi dropped Straight Hellfire with their third album. Special Interest wrapped their socially conscious ethos into some great dance punk. Wise Blood crafted a symphonic slam dunk that stands tall next to Titanic Rising. Jockstrap asserted themselves as pop's most forward-thinking band. The second-to-last Brockhampton album was Kevin Abstract grieving over some phenomenal beats, and Sunlux made the soundtrack to my favorite film of the year. What else is there? Uh, uh, going back to Miami? No, no, that, that wasn't this year. Number one. It's Spoon. It's calm down, the heart is cut. I debated with myself for a while about whether or not this was really my number one album this year. But sometimes, the obvious answer is the correct one. Sometimes, when you stray from what is true in your heart, you end up returning to it all the same. For those of you who don't know, Spoon is my favorite band. They are responsible for my favorite album of all time and some of my favorite albums of the past 15 years. And the streak continues with their 10th album, Lucifer on the Sofa. I don't know how to neatly summarize why these songs work so well, aside from saying it's Spoon, followed by some nice frothing at the mouth. Barring that, I'll just say that all 10 of these songs showcase Spoon's unique blend of confident songwriting, production prowess, and endless supply of rock swagger. The pitch-perfect introduction and stellar Bill Callahan cover that is held, the thick saunter of the hardest cut, the sure-footed delivery of Feels Alright, the atmosphere of Astral Jacket and the title track, the simple purity of Wild, My Babe, and Satellite. There's a song for every occasion and feeling on here. So yeah, Lucifer on the Sofa is outstanding, and it is my favorite album of 2022. A huge thanks to all the artists that I mentioned in this video for putting out such great music in 2022. I also urge you to consider supporting them or whoever made your favorite music of this year by buying physical media, concert tickets, merch, anything like that. I'll be taking a break for the rest of the holidays and I should be back sometime early next year. Thank you all for watching. Happy holidays, happy new year, and I'll see you soon.